Hello, welcome to Hot Pot. I'm your host, Joni Poon, stirring the pot on Asian BIPOC mental health and wellness. Okay. Hi, Jason. It's so lovely to finally have this opportunity to connect with you and for our listeners and guests to really hear the amazing story and your journey. I um, know you went from like a different, it feels like another lifetime because you went from being an engineer uh, and practicing engineer to now you're back in school and discovering what it's like for you to not only spread um, your passion and telling other people about your journey in mental health and becoming a counselor to support other people who suffer from BFRB, which is body focused repetitive behaviors. Um, Yeah, thank you. And I know, uh, you know, some of our listeners might not even be aware of that. I think it's so important to share this message so that, you know, to let other people know they're not alone and that there are support and there are other people going through this. I think that's so important. But before we dive into all that, um, let's go back to some of our roots. Like, I know Jason Yu is your full name. Do you Mm -hmm. have a Chinese name that goes with that? Um, Yeah, I, I do. I'll, though it's a little underwhelming <laughs> um so it's literally just like a chinese version of my english name it's like jason um but the story that goes along with that is uh like for my parents so i'm a second generation chinese canadian um my mom's from hunan or sorry hubei my dad's from hunan china They immigrated sort of in the late 80s. Um, And when they came to Canada, you know, they didn't really know how to speak English. Uh, My mom didn't know any, like, basically white people names. Um, So there was a time where she was going to name me after when they were living in Vancouver. Um, They had, like, uh, their apartment, their neighbor. Um, It was a white family. There was, like, two little boys. So my mom's like, yeah, Jason, I might have named you one of these two white boy names no. <laughs> um, it, it could have been tom um so there there's an alternate reality where my name's tom um there's mm. an alter also an alternate reality where my name could have been wiki <laughs> and me and my sister we hear this story and we're like, mom like that's not a name like this white boy's name was not wiki he's like no it was for sure it's wiki and we're like I think you're like mishearing something um like my guess is it's like Ricky like Richard but again my mom English is not her first language Mm. she um you know just misconstrued it Mm -hmm. uh luckily my sister named me so um my sister is six years older than me and uh she's like oh what if we named him jason 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 Mm. jason and um it just like i think my sister had already decided and like uh drew a card to be like welcome to the world jason before my parents had already decided (laughs) um but that in and of itself is because my sister was in kindergarten at the time she had a crush on the again white boy in 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 kindergarten his name was jason so i am named after this person Mm. Um, and i guess i bring the story up because i feel like like i mentioned i kind of don't really have what i feel like is a real chinese name and i think uh that sort of speaks to what it's like being uh child of immigrants as you're sort of like Mm -hmm. caught in both worlds where people expect you to have a Chinese name Mm -hmm. and I don't um, and then like the name that I have is sort of like this like a name of assimilation you know Mm -hmm. like where I just spent my whole life like trying to be a white person Mm -hmm. Um, I was named after a white person and um, yeah I don't know I think that's like a that's a theme it started before I was even born of just like you know I think a mixture of my parents not really knowing how to be here in Canada and um yeah just like we're all fumbling our way through Mm -hmm. so that's sort of the story of my name and um 
yeah anyways that's, that's i love it I, I, it fits it fits like it fits with what you're telling and sharing because i know you know when i either whether they're clients or even myself because uh I'm considered second generation, even though it's first generation, because uh, I was born in Hong Kong. And then although I did grow, like I did spend a couple of years, more than a couple of years in North America, I guess I'm considered second generation. And it it is a struggle because no, no matter where I went, it's like you don't really fully fit and assimilate. But you're no, and it shows that growth you're doing, like assimilating into a new culture, a new country, and then showing. The, even the struggles of your parents like I, I think I heard this Ricky Wick, Wiki <laughs> although it would be really cool if your name was Wiki <laughs> it sounds okay here's my nerdiness that comes out it sounds like some kind of character from Star Wars or something <laughs> okay yes uh, right Wiki I was like oh yes it sounds really cool um, but a uh, good thing that I guess your sister is like nope I want it to be Jason predetermined it and it is <sighs> Um, from what I'm hearing, like, yes, of course, that assimilation of white culture or someone based on who's white and still like someone she had a crush on. So it's like from from how I say it's like out of love. <laughs> and yeah. then she like, you know, like this feeling of how she makes her feel. And then, you know, that perhaps that's how you make her feel. <laughs> All right. And um, yeah, it's it's really cool to see how that origin really even shows through your story how you started even before you were cognitively aware to be able to make decisions for yourself and how a lot of that shapes our identities. And I'm curious if we can dive a little bit more to that because it's so interesting how you brought in the cultural piece and your identity. Do you still feel like, do you feel that Jason fits you? Like, do you feel that that's who you are and that's a big Mm. part of your identity? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think like, yes, in that I feel like very painfully, I don't know, just like white, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. so so a banana. Mm-hmm. Um, so I grew up in Chilliwack, which mm-hmm. I it's about, you know, two hours east of Vancouver. Vancouver, pretty metropolitan, you know, very multicultural, diverse, a lot of Asian people in Vancouver. In Chilliwack, it's just like, all Dutch Mennonite farmers <laughs> like, it's just 90 percent 90 95 percent white people um I very much felt like I was like the only two Asian people in my class or mm. in my school it was me mm. and my sister who again much older than me mm. um so yeah so much I think that's very imprinted into who I am like you know it's it's kind of like a hacky thing to say now but like you know I hated going to Chinese school I hated learning mm-hmm. piano mm-hmm. I just wanted cheese and crackers and like remember like hockey player numbers you know like um I, my Mandarin to this day is terrible uh, mm-hmm. and yet I decided to go into French immersion um, mm-hmm. and learn a colonizer's language because that's a cool thing to do mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah so you know I think growing up I didn't have the self-awareness I was just I mean no kid does right they just Mm want to fit in yeah and all the cool people all you know in North America all of media is just a certain race of people so Mm -hmm. it makes sense I don't necessarily blame myself for the like self-hatred I internalized Mm -hmm. I just I'm at this point where I get it like Mm -hmm. I get it Jason here you are um, so in that way, I feel like Jason, maybe it's not an Asian name, but it's a very like Asian American name. It's like a very mm. like, Asian Canadian name. So yeah, you know, it's like a I blend am. is what I'm hearing. Yeah, a blend. That's so beautiful. And that piece of like, okay, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't very aware. And a lot of us aren't when we're younger and recognizing that I just want to have that feeling of belonging being accepted and then that piece that stood out to me that Mm self-hatred it's so big because I feel like oftentimes one can get into that struggle even like even you sharing your story about your name that struggle that piece is like who's Jason 
and am I this or that, or do I love this or wait, because I'm not accepted and everything, everything around me in the external environment looks different or behaves differently. Um, am, am I accepted in that way as well? Do I belong? And so, and when you can see, cause outwardly we don't look the same, right? Mm. Especially during at those times and in a, in a place where Chilliwack is more of like a small town. Yeah. Uh, so less so, um, it's just feeling like, oh, do I really fully accept myself because I look different or, or that self-hatred piece that you talked about? Mm-hmm. Do you mind mm-hmm. sharing more about that? And Yeah, yeah and of that, course. Sorry, one more, one more question to that. Did that feed into some of your uh, mental health challenges that you grew up mm-hmm. with? Or, and yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the self-hatred piece you know, sometimes like maybe self-hatred is like, I think some people say like, oh, that's such a big word. But mm. I, I, I felt it, right? Like, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, I hate the fact that I'm different. I hate the fact mm-hmm. that, you know, I just want to fit in. Mm-hmm. I remember like growing up, like making excuses. I didn't want to invite friends over to my house because our furniture was weird or like my parents were always like playing strange music or, you know, like, so I would make excuses to, you know, like we'll play in the park, we'll play at other kids' friends' house, but I would never like host the sleepover at my house. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I kind of sense that imbalance, right, of, I'm always going to their house. They're never coming over to mine. They have all these cool toys, you know. Um, I think a part, not that we grew up poor, but like I think a part of the immigration piece is there's also like a class element, right? And just like income disparity, both my parents working full time, um, not <laughs> affording like cable television, not owning all the cool toys you know, you sort of look down on yourself. Um, Mm. But in a way that it's like, I don't want you to pity me. And so I'm kind of like, gonna, like, you know, I think a a piece of the self hatred is it motivates you to like, hustle and like work hard. And like, you know, that's part of the like, immigrant mentality that I like, love and celebrate. Um, Yeah, so I think it's like, it's more complex than just oh my god i hated my childhood right Mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know if that answers your question it does it does i think it's so beautiful because oftentimes i think when when we start talking about our internal struggles or things that or parts of ourselves that we don't like because i know there's parts of myself like growing up i developed perfectionism and it was also a means to cope and then i I recognize like wait a minute, you know, two truths can exist at the same time. Yes, it's a means of coping and perfectionism is a form of anxiety that prevents me from doing certain things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's through that perfectionism and desire and drive to do better that has allowed me to be where I am at doing the work I love that I do now. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, you know, only paint one brush stroke, right? It's a lot more Mm -hmm. complex. It can add a lot more different nuanced colors that if you're willing to explore those parts of yourselves can really open up and show you more. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Right. Well, so yeah, you're asking about the like mental health component. I think like, yeah, like perfectionism for sure is a part of it. Um, Sort of this, this like people pleasing tendency, like not wanting Mm -hmm. to take up space, like, Mm -hmm. Oh, always putting other people's needs above my own. Like Mm -hmm. always like, wanting to like be valuable to other people like there's Mm -hmm. this sort of there's this certain element of like proving my worth constantly Mm -hmm. like demonstrating Mm -hmm. like hey Mm -hmm. like um, you know pick me I want to be on the team too you shouldn't exclude Mm -hmm. me Mm -hmm. like I'm valuable for this reason like don't kick me out of your country (laughs) um so uh yeah I, I think I've just like internalized so much of that and you know in ways that I'm still like it is still this ever unfolding um and I think uh you know it it is what motivates me to explore my mental health now is just recognizing that there's so much like so much like of these like thought patterns to unearth 
right? Just because they're they're buried, um, just growing up. Yeah. Mm. Um, tell us more. Like you, you said that it really motivated you to start exploring your mental health. At what point mm. did you start recognizing that? Like, oh, <laughs> something's not not feeling quite right for you, and or it's right. like, oh, okay, I think I this is something I I need to explore because, um you know, like that wanting to fit in. And I know, especially within the Asian culture or Asian mm. Canadian culture, there's still that strong stigmatism uh, around stigmatism around mental health. And, and I think totally. that's a lot of it's learned from society and from our parents. Like I know right. with my parents, um, <laughs> it's interesting how I even got into this field uh, with my parents, you know, even when I talk about therapy, it's like, I'm not broken. There's nothing wrong with me. You need therapy. And I'm like, yes, you're right, mom. I do need therapy. That's why I'm in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know like the most asian thing about me was the fact that i was a civil engineer and like mm -hmm. probably the whitest thing about me is now i'm a therapist you know <laughs> like it's like um again that that constant tension of i'm trying to be more asian but the only mm -hmm. way almost to like rediscover my asianness is having to go through this like very white medium mm -hmm. uh as an engineer a lot of my coworkers were asian um a lot of people in the program were asian now it's just like all white women. i don't know if you experienced this jody but it's just like exclusively white women which again bless them it's fine it's what it is it's just sort of the cultural landscape that we um, are part of but um, mm -hmm. going to your question like um I think for so long, I didn't realize, like, well, I didn't even know what the term model minority was. Um, mm. And I certainly didn't know it was a bad thing. Like, I thought, yes, of course, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to become a, you know, doctor, engineer, lawyer. Uh, but I'm never going to be angry. You know, I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to work really hard. Um if someone disrespects me, I'm going to become the better person and allow them to disrespect me and they'll they'll take advantage of me, but that's okay. Deep down, I am like, no, that's all a lie. Um, but that was sort of what I, um, you know, I absorbed. I just assumed mm. that is what it means to be a good Asian son in Canada. Like, mm. just never be angry. Mm. Um I think I remember I heard this thing once where, uh, you know, it was sort of this like, this is like an Asian son asking their Asian dad of like, oh my God, like, this is so unfair. Like, what the heck? Um, it's so unfair to be here in America. And they're like, you know, yes, it is unfair. This is actually what my dad has. He's like, don't expect life to be fair. Um, you're going to have to work twice as hard as what the other person does to get the same. And you can either like whine and complain about it or you can double down work twice as hard and get it and celebrate that and like you can be proud of the fact that you work twice as hard and you know in the past i would not along to that story i think that makes sense you know like sure life's not fair i'll work twice as hard now i'm at this point where um yeah i i guess like the model minority man this is me kind of going through my like cultural wokeness is that is just a story constructed by white people to pit us Asians against other minorities you know like um, it is a tool to like keep us in in the hierarchy to be like okay Asians you're allowed to be second don't try to come to first place but you should be happy with second place and you are there to like cause um battle <laughs> with with the other like um racialized people the other minorities and so i guess i think i was like dutifully playing the model minority piece not realizing it was a trap um mm -hmm. until i'm sorry yeah i'm sorry if i'm like just making this very concept heavy but like um you know have you heard the term bamboo ceiling mm -hmm um so you know I, i'm sure like similar to like the glass ceiling for women mm -hmm. like you know bamboo ceiling uh i guess 
that sort of you know and i am slightly embarrassed to this where i i only like started caring about social issues once it like personally impacted me but i mean that's kind of how it goes mm -hmm. i was like doing my model minority grind working hard as an engineer and it was only once i like hit that ceiling of like no jason we're not going to give you this promotion you didn't sell yourself you didn't advocate for yourself you were too quiet like you were like too like nice um and you, you weren't aggressive enough to get what like yeah if you want if you if you really think you deserve it you should fight for it that's not that's a very like american <laughs> mentality not a very asian one and so that was really the realization of oh all of this is a trap right that's the i'm gonna work double for something that like to get equal of what other people are getting and i'm like that's not fair and i don't want to be a part of that um so that's sort of what pushed me to quit my job and be like okay i'm gonna look into my mental health um you know, my anxiety you mentioned bfrb so um, that stands for body focused repetitive behavior sort of similar to ocd um you know maybe people out there you know, you know people who they bite their nails um they grind their teeth uh, people who like compulsively pull out their hair for me I like compulsively pick at my skin and for a long time people thought it was eczema they're like oh Jason like your hands are really dry you should really use lotion um, but deep down I knew it was something that I was like compulsively doing and I couldn't stop myself like I would like like yell at myself like Jason like stop doing this you're causing so much damage but I like it's like a behavioral addiction like i didn't want to do it but i couldn't stop myself so um it was when yeah my skin picking was really impacting me despite the fact that like i was doing all the things that i was supposed to do right jason you're have a good job living in a great city all of these things but like i checked all the boxes and yet i was still anxious and that's when i'm like I, I think there's something wrong here, you know, something doesn't add up. So, yeah, anyways, well, here I am. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm on my mental health journey. I, I really appreciate you sharing that so openly and, and really talking about your struggles and one piece that, or actually there were a few pieces that stood out to me. Um, one that stood out to me is like that uh, bit that, you know, that minority uh mentality and you said oh acting more like an asian instead of a a westerner or a caucasian and then i there's a bit of me a part of me that's curious that it's like oh is that what asians do we don't speak up or we hide and i'm like huh wait it almost reminds me of a book that i read it's called minor feelings by mm. kathy park yes and then how within the north american system the structure like it, it it's so ingrained is that it is a form of control mm -hmm. right and and then we're made to feel that way so that we act in a certain way and mm -hmm. our parents feel it even more because they're first generation right or mm -hmm. new immigrants feel it more and then so then through their actions and behaviors directly or indirectly we we pick that up as well mm -hmm. right and and i wonder it's like is it true though because i lived in asia and um uh, maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but, mm. uh, to, and my experience when in Asia is like, it's very competitive too. Like mm -hmm. if you want something, you speak up for yourself or mm. may not be speak up as the way Caucasians would speak up. Mm. You, you work hard to show, and then you, you, you make sure that you're selling yourself, not in a North American way, but it's very different. Right. And so mm. I was like, I wonder how much of it is it actually cultural base like asian cultural mm -hmm. base of not speaking up for yourself or is it because it's shaped by the external societal um right. expectations and systems that are put into place and mm. you know the of uh, the ethnical um ethical ethnic ethnicity sorry that's what i meant to say ethnicity um that comes into play in controlling the minority right within right. a larger system i wonder mm. right and it's 
Yeah. Yeah, totally. No, and I think that's, yeah, I think I appreciate that challenge. I mean, Asia is a huge continent. It's not a monolith. So I will not speak for, um, you know, all of it. Uh, but I think there is like different ways that they complement each other. Mm -hmm. um, like, I feel like, you know, China having such an influence on Asian culture and like, mm -hmm. especially like Confucianism, mm -hmm. which I oh, feel yes. like has a lot of respect for like mm -hmm. authority and hierarchy mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. respecting your elders. Um, mm -hmm. So I think th there's a component there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a component of like um, not wanting to stand out, like the collectivist mm -hmm. piece, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, being in the West, you value individuals, mm -hmm. you value standing up, you value having your own opinion. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is being in a collectivist culture, it's like, oh, no, like the less you stand out and the more you like, contribute to the greater goal, that like, that is what's celebrated. That mm -hmm. determines your worth as mm -hmm. a citizen, as a family member. Mm -hmm. um, that collectivism. And it's very yeah. true. If I, may I add more to that? It really Please. got me thinking because um, I, I, as I've shared, I was born in Hong Kong. I grew up there for a few years, moved back and forth. And Hong Kong, unlike the rest of China, was colonized mm. by the British. Mm. And I, when I'm sharing stories and some of it, you may hear through the stories shared in the podcast is that oh people from china experience things in that asian culture differently from how i how i experienced mine as well within hong mm -hmm. kong i think because of that collectivism that asian mentality yet it was colonized by the british you also had that <laughs> mixed western kind of thought and then totally. throw that in with the confucius like filial piety and respecting authority but then i'm like oh wait if you look at another deeper level it's also trauma. It's like survival. Like in order for you to survive in, during that colonization era mm. uh, period of time, you want to make sure that you put the white people on a pedestal mm. so mm. that if you gain favor with them, you would be seen as part of them so mm. that you belong so that you won't be on the other end, which is not so great, right? Absolutely. And I wonder if that is also survival as well, right? Yeah. And so it's so tricky. Like the more I journey through this and discover myself more and hearing other people's stories like yours, Jason, it really makes me start to recognize it's like, okay, how much of this is really external mm. values uh, mm. and things that are taught by society, culture, um, parents, and all the other contexts that we live in, in in a bit larger system that is external and they're they don't mm -hmm. it's not all separate they are they one affects the other right totally. and then how much of it is my internal from processing experiencing and and mm -hmm. how to tease those two things apart it's been mm -hmm. quite quite the journey for me as well and mm -hmm. and recognizing okay how does one impact the other my the externals mm -hmm. versus my internals and there's no right or wrong answer. It's just like so complex, as you said, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for adding um, that part of your story. And you mentioning like the survival piece, like mm -hmm. for me and I like reflect on kind of stories that my parents told me, like, you know, my dad went through the like cultural revolution, right? <laughs> like uh, his family like my my dad would tell me stories of him like at the age of 10 just roaming the streets just without parents mm -hmm. because all of the adults were shipped off to the countryside to like work in a communist rice factor uh, mm -hmm. rice farm so mm -hmm. um you, you know that was what my dad was telling me okay jason you're in this environment like where uh people are out to get you you know like no one is like there to protect you your your family won't be there to protect you when like someone shows up at your door so you need to like survive you need to like rely on your instincts you need to take care of yourself you mm -hmm. can't take up too much space don't be too loud don't draw attention upon yourself um so y you know again i like to complain about white people but like you know, Chinese people do that to other Chinese people, right? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, people are awful, like just a, a terrible animal, very destructive, right? We um, can be. 
we can we be, can. I think. Yeah, we can be. I think people can be. We have that side of us. We have that dark shadow within all of us. We can be very uh, not nice, not very kind and awful, like you mentioned. And at the same time, there are people that are very wonderful that sh- spread light and and who are more. I think it really depends on what mm. happens. Is that if they're like that, maybe is it because of their, they allow their traumas to take control of them? They allow their fears and need for control versus like someone who acts out of like from kindness from their heart is more like or wanting to support others is like from a place of compassion, from a place of understanding their own wounds as well, instead of fighting it is from what I understand, or that's how I perceive it, because that's where I am at. And, and then spreading that light, because wanting to connect with others, have like not divide, because a lot of the awful things is like about dividing and control. The other things is about connection, and then encouraging of like, Let's go within. Let's really discover your authentic parts of yourself, not mm. not narrated and dictated by what society parents have said. And then even what you were sharing earlier on, it's like, as I was listening, so intriguing. It's like, oh my gosh, how you behaved earlier on is like what your dad taught you because that's how he learned to survive. Mm. No one's going to look after you. You have to work taste heart. Like That's how he survived so that he was yeah. teaching you how to survive. And that's his way of loving you. And at the same time, passing on trauma. And that's why they call it intergenerational and ancestral trauma, right? It's yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I think, yeah, something that you were sharing, a point that I was leading that I wanted to mention is like, I, you know, I think in sharing about this, in learning about it, something that I wanted to land on is like, oh, okay, I don't want to be a victim of my circumstances. Mm-hmm. Like, regardless of you know what hand I was dealt Mm -hmm. where I find myself in life I think um I was at this point where it's like okay you know hey yeah some messed up things happen but at the same time I'm very fortunate like Mm -hmm. super incredibly lucky Mm -hmm. to like be here in Canada like have all these benefits afforded to me um all these privileges and Mm -hmm. I think very easily, again, there's an alternate reality Jason out there. His name's Wiki. (laughs) He is mopey, right? Like, he is just very angsty and being like, oh my gosh, the world's, like, messed me over. um, And I'm just going to be angry about it. And I Mm -hmm. think for me, that was the decision of, like, hey, you know what? Um, I want to connect, right? I want to better understand what was happening because I don't think I just want to like make the decision to be sad and angry for the rest of my life um Mm -hmm. and so I think that was that journey to like look inwards to better Mm -hmm. understand Mm -hmm. um yeah because it's just life's more meaningful that way so I'm curious like what gave you the the gumption or the what spurred that energy of like wanting to look more within or discover yourself or even even start exploring mental health? Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you said because things got so bad, it's like, and what allowed you to get over that hump? Because things can get really bad and still people like Mm -hmm. can, can wait and sit with it or let it get even worse (laughs) before Mm -hmm. uh, doing that. I'm just curious, like what, what, inspired or what led you to go get over that hump yeah. or to even like quit your job like it's like okay this is not working because that's a, such a brave thing to do like you've worked so hard you were an engineer and then suddenly you're like nope because a lot oftentimes people and i understand that because it's much easier to stay in comfort with what they know they'd rather stay mm-hmm. and then maybe look for another engineering job for example yeah. so what allowed you to actually cross that hurdle like to even make this big shift yeah um I ask myself that question a lot because sometimes I regret it I'd be like Jason why'd you do this to yourself (laughs) (laughs) um you had it pretty good um so I don't know if I've landed on one answer as with a lot of what I've chatted about today it's multifaceted um but I'll point out a few points um one of them is like appreciating like health like I think this is again something my dad taught me is you don't um you don't value something until it's gone Mm -hmm. and so uh I didn't 
really value my health until it was sort of taken from me and like the experience of living with compulsive skin picking so I would get these like cuts so you know I sort of have one that's like Mm -hmm. healing over right now and it's sort of this one um but honestly like my hand it used to be covered with these like cuts and scratches and scars um just like bending my fingers the cuts they would like bleed and Mm -hmm. like just like opening doorknobs like Mm -hmm. holding pencils just Mm -hmm. simple tasks like that were Mm -hmm. like painful to do um so you know there's a lot of days where it's just like it's honestly just like painful to like be in the world Mm -hmm. um so kind of being at the depths of that of like like this like my mental health is really kind of like impacting me you know just Mm -hmm. kind of understanding the the time it's taking the opportunities um that I'm not doing I'm not able to live my life because of that so Mm -hmm. I think there was a piece of that um so uh in learning about like BFRBs um I started meeting with people for the first time in my life like I had this language with the power of Google I just started like meeting other people basically on Instagram. Um, and like, oh my gosh, you have this too? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I remember I, I went to this like um, like online support group meeting. It was just during COVID, like 10 people in a room and were chatting. And um, there was this one lady who signs on. And uh, okay, actually, I remember these two people talking. This one person was like a kid. This person was like 12. And they're sharing in the Zoom room with adults, like, hey, I compulsively pull out my hair. I'm really f- afraid. Like, will this be the rest of my life? Um, I get bullied at school and I'm just, I'm really sad and I don't want this to be my life. Um, like, please help. This 12 year old said this. A person who chimes in is this like 50 year old woman. She's like, kid, you're doing great. Like, for you to be 12, you're in this Zoom room. You have this community, all these people you, you talk about who you um, pull your hair. That's amazing. For me, I'm 50. I've gone my whole life, like, picking at my skin. 40, 50 years. I never knew anyone. I've, like, been through marriages. I never told my husband. Um, I only found out other people did this, like, three months ago. So for you to be 12, meeting other people talking to people about it like you are worlds ahead of where i'm at just now right i'm beginning my journey at 50. so this is me like i I, i'm like sitting in the zoom room watching these two people chat i'm like again holy shit like i could have so easily just never found this never found out what a bfb was kept on picking my skin 40 50 years I could have died you know just Mm. not knowing anything about this it continuing to consume my life like Mm. impacting dating like Mm. you know just not wanting to put myself out there um Mm. yeah so that's that scared me um Mm. so that was a push factor another thing keep on mentioning my parents but like recognizing that uh the time I quit my job I was like 28 Mm -hmm. um my for my parents my dad when he was 28 um he had not uh I think my dad came to Canada when he was 31 or 32 so when he landed in Canada he had um you know no education no money no job no family support system no like language you know Mm. like he didn't have a driver's license he didn't know how to do anything Mm. um and yet he still built this beautiful life here in Canada Mm -hmm. so he had all of these things he had to start from zero whereas for me I was 28 you know have a degree education all this money saved like all this support network again I'm like oh my god like I think here I have this opportunity, right? Like, if anything, this is what I told myself. I have one year, I have two years. 
put my job on pause, I'm going to like figure out as much as I can about my mental health. Um, even if I, nothing happens and I just like I burn through my savings, I will still have more than what my parents started with mm. here in Canada. Um, mm. So I think I just have to try. And so mm. that was sort of something that I'm like, I'm quitting my job. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. It's like recognizing the privilege you have and then recognizing your parents, your father's bravery and starting from like scratch, right? That's what happens when immigrants move. Well, not all, but yeah. And and especially when they don't come from status and wealth and then recognizing, oh, what an opportunity to have. And you just leapt in and took that risk without like an expected outcome is what I'm hearing. And the beautiful thing I've also heard is like that, that necessity of not necessity, that did deep desire to, re- to finally listen to your body and saying, okay, mm. body, you're telling me that this is not the way to live. I mean, if you're opening a doorknob and your hands are bleeding and you're like excruciating pain, and I can imagine how painful it is. It's like you finally listening to your body screaming at you. That's been trying to tell you a lot of things a long time ago, right? Mm, and, totally. And, and it, it, you know, like it takes, it takes that want and desire to actually listen because we we can so easily dissociate, disconnect mm. for sure. And you didn't do that. And on top of that, that desire for community and connection, that mm. group story, it's like mm. it's so beautiful. I, I mean, that's why I'm so inspired, and I'm sure I'm not speaking for you. Um, maybe that's why you you're creating this BFRB community. Um, through youtube and mm. um you know for any of our listeners who wants to find out more or want to work with jason uh, i'll include that in our notes later um and put uh in the instagram tags as well um but that's another reason why i wanted to create this i want us to i want to create a space for people to share their stories to to create a community like to create a community in essence so that we're not alone because we Mm -hmm. don't have to suffer alone we don't have to do this alone and and knowing this is just in itself is healing I feel Mm -hmm. like it's just so lovely and then you never knew like you never know like I, I remember talking to some people and even myself I wish like I wish someone before me did this so I can learn from them and even though it might not be the exact situation or circumstances or anything, at least it gives me a starting place, right? Mm. Or if even if none of that happens, it it gives me permission to even try, okay. right? Like how your dad immigrating here to Canada and recognizing that gave you permission to even just like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to quit my job mm. and explore my mental health. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, can you share, do you mind sharing, like, what are some of the mental health explorations you've done that that you're still unfolding into, it sounds like? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I think, you know, it's like, I feel like every other day I'm realizing this thing of, like, oh, shit, is that something I'm supposed to know how to do? Like, uh, I... I uh, Yeah, I guess. Hmm. How do I even begin to answer that question? I feel like I'm a deeply repressed person. <laughs> I don't know if that's fair to say. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know how to express my emotions. Um, or like, you know, I'm getting better at it. But I still like, yeah, catch myself. And I'm still like, um, I feel this need to like, constantly be performing. Like, you know, that thing where Maybe you're at a dinner party with a bunch of people and there's like a silence in the room. I, I have, I, you know, that's when my brain kicks in of like, oh, Jason, say something funny to say. Mm-hmm. Have something funny to say. Have something funny to say. Um, and I'm just like constantly hosting on edge. Like, let me get you water. Mm-hmm. Oh, here, let me pass you the garlic bread. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really know how to relax. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dentist, I went to the dentist last week. They actually said, um, again, Jason, you're like, oh, uh, we noticed you like clench your jaw a lot. And I'm like, yeah, no surprise, blah, blah, blah. Told them about my skin picking thing. And they're like, yeah, that's interesting. Um, we think you're in a constant state of fight or flight. And so mm-hmm. your body doesn't, like, you know, your your jaw isn't 
having the chance to relax mm. like oh like mm. thanks I guess mm. um and they quoted me for this very expensive therapy mm. treatment that I need to do like physio mm. kind of mm. um my dentist gave this to me just like mm. two weeks ago mm. so that's sort of yeah I think part of the it's still like it's still this unfolding journey mm. yeah jason it's okay you don't need to hustle you can just watch youtube videos for the next two hours it's fine mm. no one's gonna hate you because mm. of that like relax mm. um i don't know if you experience this jody you're sort of this entrepreneurial multi person force you're starting a podcast you have your own business do you have this like need to be productive all the time yeah I do actually thank you for uh, asking I do I do actually have this need um or almost compulsion to be productive like even when I come home and I see dishes full that, that are full and instead of like relaxing besides my partner I was like oh let me clean this up and I understand that that's part of my anxieties. Like I, I feel anxious when my environment's not clean um, or when I'm anxious, I feel like I need to be productive. And then that sometimes ties into my self-worth piece for sure. And then that other piece is like, it's also a coping mechanism. It allows me to soothe myself when I'm busy doing everything, something, mm. everything, something. Um, and like what your dentist mentions, like, oh, it's your nervous system trying to, to fight, flight, or freeze. And that's me like flighting, uh, like as in leaving, avoiding, not doing what I need to not procrastinate on and keeping busy doing something else. Or fighting is like, okay, if I work harder, I'm going to, I'm going to get through this. Yeah. And it's really interesting. Like I, I recognize that, oh my gosh, this is a need because it helps me cope. And I mean, like I said before, two truths can exist at the same time. It has also really motivated and pushed me, allowed me to develop resiliency and be where I'm at and own different companies or be an entrepreneur, like you mentioned, and start a podcast. Because if I sat on thinking and dreaming, it'll never happen, right? And it also really, what I really started learning to do is like slowing things down and really asking what the intentions are, asking myself what what really resonates for me, who I am, and not in trying to fulfill a need for something else or trying to please something else or someone else, like not trying to prove to someone else and, or even myself, because <laughs> there's that, that inner critic, like you talked about that internal voice. And for me, part of that journey was like starting to recognize like, why did, I, why am I doing this? Doing it is not the problem. It's the, in, it's the intention. What's the energy behind it? And starting to recognize that because I, the more I started to learn to listen to my nervous system of course, through education. And I love how technology is so accessible now. You can research things. Um, but starting to recognize that I'm worth it. And that's why, like you, you know, before I was like, oh, all this costs so much money and I could do this. And I'm like, wait, no, I'm worth it. I'm the investment. Mm -hmm. And maybe I might not have a lot of money now doing all this, but, and not but, and if I don't invest in this, I'm going to stay where I'm at. And, I'll, and it's always that, that lack mentality and that fear state. And, and when I start recognizing and honoring that peace, uh, I think it was through a couple of meditations that really connected me with that, that nervous system feeling. It's like of peace and calm. It's like, oh yeah, this deep intuitive feeling like this is right for me. Mm -hmm. And, and also through psychedelics that really opened uh, other doors that deepened my experiences as well and, and and showing me this is what your nervous system has been busy doing all along to help you survive and you're always in survival state and this is what you need and this is what it can feel like mm -hmm. and so I'm like oh and so by recognizing and honoring that I mean I'm simplifying my experiences through psychedelics <laughs> um, but by recognizing and experiencing that through a therapeutic way I started honoring I was like oh yeah I am an investment. I am worth it. You know, it doesn't matter whether I was taught or these messages from society or anything. What I'm doing is not working. It's the survival, like what's this need? What's this energy behind it? What's this intention? And then recognizing that the intention is to actually really honor the little bits and parts of myself, even the ugly parts that I don't like, that I'm trying to avoid or run away from by doing things or proving that I'm not that. <laughs> Again, running away from. Um it had really allowed me to, to really start seeing from a place of abundance and then recognizing, okay, 
So once I started recognizing doing that and start really truly being open to exploring mental health at a deeper level. And in some of my previous podcasts, I shared how that was kind of um, almost like structured in for me because of like my interest in, in what I wanted to do as a career or as a work, uh, as a therapist, it kind of, you kind of have to go through it. So that kind of promoted that, but there, that level of wanting to really start doing self-healing and continuing that ever unfolding journey for myself and learning who I really am really deepened as I did most of the other different modalities that I mentioned. And, and by doing that, I started exploring somatic work. I started exploring energy work. I started um, really seeking, working with different practitioners. And I start recognizing it's like, oh yeah, we don't have to do this alone. And having a team, a supportive team, not only family, friends, but professionals is very helpful. And, and through that, it really allowed me to really start being more in tune of who I am. And I can allow more of those pieces to show up more. And I can not only feel but experience life in a very different way like I am attracting people who are energetically feel like more loving and more authentic or even if they're not always like that because no one's perfect I'm human so are they it's just bringing the different people that I'm I'm seeking or I'm similar going through it's almost like whatever you seek and, and put out into the universe the universe will seek you back it might not be exactly the same way you want it to be or how you envisioned it and if you can let that and surrender that control piece anxiety it can unfold in such a beautiful way and I've given been given so many different beautiful opportunities to really grow and and abundance has shown up in different ways. And so I'm learning to trust more and worry less, even in things that I don't know, in the unknown, right? Mm. Yeah, that's where I am still journeying through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah nice. Um, you, you, so like some, I think some language that I sometimes use is uh, like having a chip on my shoulder. Mm. I feel like growing up, I always sort of, like people disrespected me people overlooked me mm. like people would like like always misremember my name like I'm just sort of this like forgettable background character um you know it's sort of that uh like sidekick syndrome right mm. where I'm not the protagonist I'm perpetually just like someone mm. in the corner of the room and I sort of harbored this like yeah chip on my shoulder like mm. I don't know if it's like attention seeking or like mm. um, but I think I wanted to like prove something to someone right mm. and again that motivated me. let me work mm. harder let me try to be mm. interesting let me you know pick up all these different things uh, and I think like kind of where I was at in in engineering it's like okay yeah I like satisfied my parents I impressed them I might like within work I sort of you know did well a lot of my so many of my supervisors always like praised me for oh Jason thank you for working so hard blah 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 and yet still like I remember uh at work like I'd be in a meeting and people would just like accidentally call me the wrong name like there was this other Asian guy who's sort of my age. His name was Patrick, who sat on my floor, and then he would just like often just call me Patrick. Mm. And I'm like, I've worked so hard, like you know, like I just let me stand out and be. I'm different from Patrick. We're very mm -hmm. different, and I was sort of like, mm -hmm. Patrick's a very nice person, but I was mm -hmm. sort of like insulted that you like lumped us together. That we're sort of mm -hmm. so interchangeable, mm -hmm. so forgettable. Um, the other day, uh, I was like on the bus um, and I was skiing. So I was just, uh, I had all my ski stuff and I was like um, taking it to, to go skiing and, you know, having all this like bulky equipment, people start chatting with you. So there's this lady, white lady, a little older. She's like, oh, where are you going skiing? And like, oh, I'm gross. And she's like, oh, that's so nice. Blah, blah, blah. And we start chatting. Like, where are you from? All these things like she grew up in maple ridge or something she's like yeah where, what about you and like, oh yeah i'm from chillac i grew up in chillac like, okay um but like what about your parents where are your parents from like, oh like they're from china she's like ah so you're chinese and i'm like 
well, I'm born here. Like, I'm Canadian. She's like, ah, but like, you're Chinese. And I'm mm. like, you know, I'm not going to get into it on the bus with this, mm. like, perfectly nice lady chatting with me. But at, still, at the end of the day, she's like, oh, you don't belong here, Jason. You're some other, you're some foreigner. And I think that's sort of that feeling that I was like, spending my whole life fighting against is like no I'm interested you know like it's like I quit my job I did this I like did all these things and yet at the end of the day I'm just some random person on the bus and you're gonna like microaggress me so you know we're talking about where we're at what what's enfolding us in our mental health journey and I think I'm just like you know letting go of this feeling Mm -hmm. like who am I trying to impress, right? Mm -hmm. For so long, I was trying to get the intention of white people, trying to impress them, be like, no, I am more interesting than just your Mm -hmm. random Asian guy. But for what? Like, I was bending over backwards, you know, quote-unquote, killing myself, Mm -hmm. uh, it showing up on my hand, feeling so anxious to try to, like, be valuable to them. They don't care, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I am so much more at peace being in my community, serving other people of color, um, mm-hmm. other people who like, yeah, appreciate it. Um, and yeah, that's just like so much more meaningful for me now. Uh-huh. And, and just really kind of, again, thank you, Joni, for creating this space and like this place to like connect with other people of color um, just to talk about these things, right? Because yeah. like, where else can you talk about it? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, there's um, not much, right? Uh, I mean, I and again, I could be wrong from what I've done, the research. There's not much. It's growing. And I feel like there's still a big need for it. Because like, I thank you for pointing those things out, like recognizing I'm working so hard to prove to others. It's like external, external, spending all that energy in external. And what I'm hearing from what you shared is that, oh, wait, no, I want to see myself. I actually am on this path unfolding and valuing myself. That's why I quit my job. That's why I'm on this path of healing and mental health. And I want to create a community as it comes from within. Right. And then you're doing that for yourself. Not, not so much of like, I guess that chip you mentioned is like, it's just like, no wonder why, you know, there's that resentment and, and and you get frustrated and upset when people don't see you because you're doing all the stuff externally for people to see you. And, and I'm like, during when you're talking about that, I wonder that part of Eric, um, not, I don't know why I say Eric, sorry, that part of um, Jason is that almost like, do you, do you even see yourself? Do you want to see yourself? Because I, I, as part of Asians, like we're taught to hide. And then I also recognize for me, um, I spent a lot of my life not wanting to be seen, yet I wanted to be seen. I didn't want it to be seen because like in the culture of like where Asian kids are taught to be seen and not heard. We're also taught like in the white context, I guess we're taught to be not seen and not really heard. Right. Cause I I've experienced that what you've shared, like, Oh, you're Chinese. And I'm like, wait, we're a person. We're an individual. We're not just Chinese. We're not just Asian. We're more than that. <laughs> And, 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 or how you got confused for another Asian, which is also an aggr- micro macro aggression um, uh, of mistakenly for some another Asian, because that's not often. Like, I remember I was in a class and I was one of the only other Asian in my whole entire class as a music therapy student. And I would often get confused for the other Chinese student. So I wasn't even seen. And then so a lot of my energy and anxiety that built up and resentment and hurt and pain also came from not being seen and wanting to be seen. So I spent a lot of energy like you trying to do better, work harder, achieve all these accolades, and hopefully so that it can be seen. Also seen by my parents because you know, it's like younger as a child, they're like, oh, you did this. You got 98% on your test. Great. What happened to the 2%? I'm like, huh? <laughs> Right. So it feeds into that. And then I was like, wait, wait, wait. And then I also realized and recognized that like, I'm afraid of seeing myself because I've been taught that maybe I'm not that great. Right. And then when I started recognizing that, I'm like, wait, no, I am wonderful. I am special. And when I am willing to be in that space and actually see myself, even with all the flaws, I really can 
like I can really start seeing how I'm stepping more forward. And it has also allowed me to want to create spaces like this and have a podcast and create a community. Yeah. So thank you, like Jason, for sharing that, like how there's that shift and please correct with me wrong. I think that's what I heard is like that shift from like externalizing, spending all that energy, wanting to be seen. And yet you weren't really wanting to see yourself and to like, wait, no, no, not now. I really want to see what's really going on for Jason, not based on what, uh, how other people perceive me and see me, whether they see me or not, not, not important. Do I really see myself? Do I want to value myself? Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. So as we're wrapping up, um, I have three quick questions for you. <laughs> Might not be quick, but you can answer them briefly. Uh, the first one is, who is this Jason now that you're embodying more? Who is this Jason that I am now embodying more? Mm -hmm. Compared to the Jason you described that was like anxious and not seen and yeah. yeah totally. Or with this chip on the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like jumping into just this conversation we're just having. Um oh sorry, that's my fault. But, um, <laughs> um like the word like selfish almost comes up mm. where I think in the past I did my best to be like selfless and serving other people. And I think, you know, society has a negative connotation to the word selfish. Um, I tried to be the most selfless person possible. Again, model minority. Do, do, do. Took that to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the life that I wanted to live. And so now mm -hmm. in being a little bit more selfish or using the language that you just used of just like valuing myself more and like what does Jason want and need and care about and like don't compromise on that if mm. this is the thing that I want then like I think in the past I would second guess it and doubt it mm. be like oh no one else wants it this is just like mm. a small thing that I want now it's mm. like hey I want it and that's enough so I'm just gonna go get the thing that I want um and like trust that like I have good taste and mm. the thing that I want to see in the world, other people will also want it. Mm. Um, they just don't know it yet. They don't mm. see it yet. Like I have the vision. So I got to like make the vision mm. happen. So that's sort of, I love it. Selfish piece. <laughs> I love it. I love that selfish pit piece. Um, may, may I please. Okay. Uh, I was going to say what I'm, hearing on top of that is you're trusting yourself mm -hmm. and 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 by doing that you're connecting more and more with your authentic pieces because you can't be authentic with yourself if you don't trust yourself mm -hmm. right so yeah thank you i love that uh the second question is um if you can go back in time what would you tell your younger self what's a piece of advice you would share with yourself <laughs> um brush your teeth <laughs> is that what the dentist said a few days ago yes yes <laughs> um i don't know that's okay uh, it's okay to not know yeah uh just take bigger risks honestly mm. like mm. i think i spent so much of my life being small mm. and um i think like your my first answer my second answer my first answer are very similar mm. be selfish take risks mm, love <laughs> it okay yeah. and then the third question is like um what is something that you're curious you want to try yet you haven't tried or want to explore more learn more about or even do mm. yeah that's a good question as you continue this unfolding journey of yours um uh, hmm. Well, I think I, I was having this conversation with um, my girlfriend recently, but mm. I don't think I have very good relationships with other Asian men. Mm. Um, and uh, you talked about like scarcity and abundance before. And I mm. think growing up, 
I always like, there's sort of this like scarcity mentality of like, no, I'm the only Asian guy in this group. Back off. <laughs> uh, um, and yeah. And I think I sort of have this like, that's the internalized racism, the internalized hatred where it's like, for other Asian men, I'm instinctively like competitive with them. Mm. So I just want to soften that. I want to be curious mm-hmm. about that. Mm-hmm. I want to like just have better relationships with Asian men mm-hmm. and like really sort of form like, I don't know if alliances is the right word, community mm-hmm. or whatever, like support mm-hmm. them, lift them up. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people who get me. Um, why have I spent my whole life fighting other Asian mm-hmm. men? Mm-hmm. I'm sad about that. So that's mm-hmm. what I would like to do. I love it. I love that. I love that softening that side of yourself to create more connection with other Asian men. I love it. I like it. Thank you so much for being on my podcast today or our podcast. I don't feel like it's just mine. It's like the, the communities. And um, and depending on what our guests say, if they want to learn more about you, again, I'll put your contacts in social media Um all the other information into mm. the notes and it'll be on Instagram and TikTok as well and mm. at any point feel free to reach out to other me or Jason so again thank you so much for coming on and I'm so grateful this has been a Hot Pot Pod production brought to you by Lucinor a premier online psychedelic dispensary wander your mind at lucinor.net